Hello, and welcome to... Assetto Corsa? Yeah, I know you clicked on an automation video, and we'll get there, but I love rambly intros, and this does have some bearing on what I'm going to be making. So recently, ignoring my undeniable terribleness at sim racing, I started playing Assetto again while avoiding doing voice commentary or editing or whatever for one of my videos. Long story short, I ended up downloading a mod that gave me quite a bit of inspiration. This is the Vento Uno. It's kind of terrifying to drive, but not for the usual Assetto Corsa reasons. It's fairly stable, the brakes work fine, and you don't need to constantly slow yourself down to keep a reasonable amount of control. But it's so fast that, staring at a computer screen and driving with an Xbox controller, I swear I can almost imagine I'm feeling the g-force when I accelerate. My theory is, driving a car like this just isn't the same unless you're using first person. Combine that idea with my recent acquaintance with Philman and the subsequent reintroduction to J-Beam modding that I had, and a really terrible idea formed in my mind. And so let's... no, we're not doing automation yet, actually. You see, to motivate myself to actually get the auto build done for once, I decided to sink in as much effort as possible before the build started. So let's make an engine. With coding. This is Engine Sim, created by Ange the Great, a fellow YouTube person. It is both wonderful and painful. Basically, it uses a bunch of code to somehow simulate a somewhat realistic engine, complete with, this is the important bit for us, realistic engine sounds. It's not user-friendly at all, there are no instructions included and you have to edit the game's code to even swap engines. But with the help of a very long tutorial video, incidentally it's Filmin's, you can sort of, kind of, maybe blunder your way into coding an engine. So let's do that. I've chosen an 8-cylinder boxer engine. Originally I was tempted to do a V8, but I decided I wanted something a bit quirkier and, well, what is an 8-cylinder boxer engine anyway if not for a 180 degree V8? Using the Subaru engine I showed earlier as a donor engine, that is, stealing various chunks of code from it and modifying them for the extra cylinders, I slowly build up my own engine. I can't really linger much on this section because I genuinely still have no idea how this works. I only managed to do any of it because I was following the tutorial. Eventually I try to load the engine only to discover four errors. These are easily fixed by actually remembering to give the engine crankshafts. On the other hand, my friend Sets gave this a try and got 16 errors, none of which we could figure out how to fix. Your mileage may vary. In any case, this makes the engine work, but like, only a little bit. Yeah, it really isn't happy right now, but thankfully I'm not the only person who's tried to do this. A much more competent person named... Orwer? I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, sorry, but they gave me permission to borrow some of their engine's code to fix mine. In the end, I get it pretty much working. Here's what it sounds like. Okay, having spent a good few days working on the engine, I'd say that's good enough. It's time to actually play automation in this automation video. Okay, there's a lot to do. We'll get to the weird body choice later, because the mechanical bits are what's important right now. Normally I don't really give much thought to this stuff, because I don't care all that much and it's not that interesting to look at, but this car is different. 
Fast auto cars are almost always undrivable, and since this is meant for some weird beam equivalent of sim racing, it's even more important to make the car work as well as I can. Automation doesn't have an 8-cylinder boxer engine, but that's okay. We'll add the sound from engine sim and beam, and in auto we'll just use a 6-cylinder and our imagination. I only have a couple things I care about with this engine. It needs to be reasonably powerful, say around 700 or 800 horsepower. Though that's subject to change, as of recording this line, the car's only like halfway done. It also needs to be naturally aspirated. High power is already dangerous in beam, and turbo lag makes it so much worse. I want nothing to do with that. I don't really care that much about anything else, because, well, it's easy to make a fast engine, it's everything else that's the problem. Speaking of which... The goal for this car is sort of a blend between race car and road-going hypercar, so despite its track focus, it's getting some pretty fancy stuff in the other mechanical menus, not to mention the quality spam I do with all my faster cars. I initially made it all-wheel drive, but I changed it to just the rear wheels off-screen after deciding that all-wheel drive encourages sliding through tight corners a little too much. The tires are only semi-slicks because it's all auto allows you to do, but I do have a nice trick for fixing that that I'll show off soon. The brakes will get tuned later, so I put zero thought into them for now. The safety and assist menus don't matter much, but it's worth noting that this is probably my first race car in years to get actual safety. After optimizing the car for lightweight and doing the initial suspension stuff, I go back and do a basic retune of everything. But you don't care, and I don't care either, so let's move on to the styling. The Valkyrie body is, in my opinion, one of the worst in the game, and though this is a modded version that fixes a couple of problems, the fact remains that it's just very hard to style this body. I am, however, forced to use it. I've tried to do hypercars in auto in the past and always failed because of one little problem that I only recently figured out. Hypercar cabins are narrower than the rest of the body. Auto only has a few bodies that do that, and while all are horrible, this is the least bad option, so it's what we're going with. I'll be modifying it extensively to try to fix its badness. The first major problem with it is how tall the sides are. I fixed this by lowering the suspension and cutting out the extra bodywork. Unfortunately, this also means that it'll scrape the ground badly in beam, forcing me to do node editing. But that's a problem for the future. This introduces a new problem with the wheels now being inside the fenders, but before fixing that, I decide to introduce the main and most important styling feature of the car. Experimenting with warped placement, essentially take a fixture, make it 3D, rotate it, and make it 2D again to warp it at that angle, I give the car some absolutely massive side intakes to hide the tall, flat sides. Once again, I'm causing more problems for myself, because due to how fixtures mold to the body, there's a giant pit in the vent right below the window. But again, we'll deal with that in the future. I quickly cut bigger holes for the wheels, though I'll end up redoing this a few times. The normal windows are also horrible, so I paint them to match the body and then cut out my own window shape. I mentioned a trick for slick tires earlier. Gone are the days where we had to paint a tire with a plastic material, now we can just use this slider over here. And there you go, racing slicks. This car will have no doors as such, because I definitely don't want to make seams on the vents. So instead, I'm going to make the entire roof into a hatch. To do this, I add kind of an ugly seam. Like many other things in this video, I'll improve it off-screen. It turns out to be very simple to do the windshield. One carefully placed bit of glass patchwork can cover the whole area. I add some hood vents, and then I get lazy and use a single fixture for the entire front grille. Having apparently used up all of my creative energy doing this, I try getting the AI from my AI car video to design the car for me with... questionable results. Now that I've been shocked back to my senses by what you're seeing now, it's time for me to design some headlights. I use the shape of a weirdly two-dimensional mod headlight, and then I fill it in with two LED lines. This will be modified later, so I won't spend a while talking about it. Not that there's much to talk about anyway. 
Okay, time for a rapid-fire list of stuff I did before we get to the next important bit. I used body morphing and more cutouts to give the car a longer tail. I gave it a huge wing. Of course I'm going to go crazy with arrow. Made out of a few modular wing pieces attached to the body only by the side bits. I added some really terrible tail lights. Don't worry, they won't last long. I changed the rims for my weird placeholder to something that is, you know, actually good. I got lazy, stopped working on the car, and sent the file to my friend Soup. So I just got Soup's file back, and while I know what he did, it's probably best to let him explain it himself. So, Soup, what did you do? So basically, in a dream, I had an idea where you put a light, and then you put a like a vent over it so you can see the light through the vent and then you like put glass so the lights like tinted and then I put that behind some tail lights so that it gives a cool effect of like a glow behind the tail light mm -hmm. I worked on some body molding stuff like on the vent um, procrastinating the middle section because that was a huge pain the main part of it is just, like, adding these conforming pieces that curve down into the body. Um, they basically curve down into the body to line up with the lower section of the vent. So like an inverse of the original body curve. Yes. Oh, and I, well, I also moved back to the diffuser. Yes, with this nice open area back here. Might put a logo or something on this piece. Um, after a long time of drawing in paint and trying to figure out what to do, um, we concluded on this design, which looks okay. Okay, well, I think that's all I needed to know, so I'm going to get back to work on this thing, and I will see you again in, like, ten days. Okay. <laughs> see ya. And so, that's what I did. The getting back to work part, that is, not the see you in ten days part. I'm really lazy, so I actually put soup to work again only five days later. Before that, though, I redesigned the headlights, or I guess maybe undesigned them. Gave the car new exhausts, trying to mimic the color and slightly askew placement of real race car exhausts. Added reverse lights. Redesigned the headlights again. And then I moved on to the worst part of every auto build. Yep, it's time for interior lining. Okay, I hate interior lining. It's one of the few things in auto where it's basically torture, but unlike, say, a custom engine like on my drag car, I can't take advantage of that for the video. There is no way for me to really accurately show you how difficult and boring this is without the video itself being boring, so you'll just have to take my word for it that this is horrible. Once I get, uh, done, I put in the basic parts of an interior, that is, a seat and a steering wheel, and then I place an interior camera, which I quickly test and beam. Then Soup gets the car again, and while I forgot to do another interview with him, it's fine. This time he's just made the beginning of a dashboard. I modify this, by which I mean sort of ruin it a little, but whatever, and then go about an important bit of sim racing immersion. Working gauges. The devs have helpfully added a fixture that uses Beam's race screen material, so when you get it to Beam... Yep, it just works. You can actually modify what it displays too, so I set that up and... This means I have to make that for auto photo scene too, don't I? <sighs> okay, so this takes a while. Luckily, there's a kind of ugly, non-functional mod that has a similar screen I can trace, but it's a lot of work. We're still going to speed through this in the edit relative to how long I actually worked on it, but I think this is a good chance to take some time and talk about the plan for this car once it's ready for export to Beam. I would have gone over this earlier, but full transparency here, I was pretty worried about the difficulty of one of these, and I decided not to write this line until I'd already done it, so I had the freedom to just not if it was too hard. Luckily, this stuff turned out to be so much easier than the crazy J-beam of my last vehicle, the Amphitruck, so I got everything I wanted done. I did mention this one at the start of the video, I'll be giving the hypercar the sound of the engine I made earlier. 
This is not hard, but it's by far the most tedious mod I'll do, which is why I'm pretty annoyed that I didn't record any of it. In short, it's a bunch of steps that are very simple yet extremely time-consuming. Record the audio, convert from video to audio files in my case, trim them in Audacity, and assign each sample the right RPM and throttle position in the beam files. All told, this is a process that takes several very boring hours, and I doubt I'll be willing to repeat it in the future. After relearning the basics of Blender, as it's been a few years, I'll trim a few ugly edges to the body that were hidden in auto but exported to beam. I don't record this either for some reason. Finally, I'll do node editing, and then something extremely important, I'll animate the steering wheel. I recorded some of both of these, so I won't spend any more time talking about it right now. This sounds like a lot to do, and it did to me too, at around the point we're at in the build. This is why, rather than finish the auto build myself, I made Soup do all the work. Okay, the file's back again. Soup had originally intended to just do some minor stuff, like dashboard lights and new steering wheel, but what he actually did was put in more work than either of us had combined for the rest of the car. So I'm not going to explain this all myself, I'm going to let him do it. We'll start with these new headlights. Well, um, I had the circles and then you changed them, and then I didn't like what you did because it was too simple, so I just made it more complicated. <laughs> very slightly more complicated. Yeah, one thing that uh, kind of bothers me is that the angle of the two horizontal bits changes based on the angle of the camera, but there's not yeah, really much you can do about that because the mesh kind of... Yeah, it's sort of a weird shape. Now, much more importantly than the headlights, there is all this, and it's hard to even know where to start, so uh, I have written down a list of all this stuff. There is a new seat, and it has... A harness. Please tell us about how you did this harness, because I don't even know where to begin thinking about this. It's a lot of very slightly turned squares and sometimes triangles. It was actually really simple to make, just kind of time consuming. I imagine it helps a bit that the driver's seat is centered so you can just mirror everything. Yeah, I have done harnesses before where the seats weren't centered, and that was more effort. I have done a custom steering wheel like that before. It was not fun, and I'm never doing it again. No, I'm definitely doing it again. What am I talking about? <laughs> Speaking and of on custom that, no, steering let's move wheels... To the... <laughs> yes, perfect, exactly. You know exactly what I'm going to say before I say it. Uh, yeah, there's a custom steering wheel. This has got to be like 7,500 fixtures. It's a lot. Uh, I will let you go over what all this stuff is. I used the Aston Martin Vulcan as reference, mm -hmm. so it's kind of really similar to that, but <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's just a, I, I did the sort of cut top because if it wasn't cut top, it'd be impossible to see the dash. And then I added a lot of buttons and stuff because lights look cool on interiors. Always. One thing I really thought was a nice touch is this like hand grip stuff. I wouldn't have thought to do that, but it adds sort of a legitimacy to this wheel that it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I also tried to come up with a reasonable use for every little button and switch in here. There aren't that many of them. I've done more in the past, but they do all actually have a use. Yeah, and there's quite a few of them too. Let's see. What is CBN? Oh, CBN is for the cabin light. Ah, uh, yeah. I would have completely forgotten to mention that in the video. Yeah, there's a little cabin light. It's nice. Okay, that's pretty much it. I will uh, do a great many things to this car. So many things. It'll be totally transformed by the time I export it. The first of the great many things is a name for the car. I have named it after a certain Italian circuit that just so happens to have been turned into a beam mod. Then I do a final paint job, and after that, everything's done for the auto-only version of the car. Let's take some photos of it. This is the new default lighting for this photo scene. Very fancy.
Before we export the car to beam, there's one last thing to do. To get the working steering wheel, you have to separate the wheel from the body in Blender. This is far easier to do if you've already done the same thing in auto, so I just move the wheel up an arbitrary amount. I should also note I've slightly modified a few other things for this export version. The materials are changed to look a little better in Beam, and I removed the custom screen so the working one is visible. In Beam, the car has a few issues, but we're going to start with the steering wheel because it's what everything else is dependent on. If I can't get the steering wheel working, I need to re-export with the normal steering wheel position to get a fixed wheel. This would require redoing any other modifications anyway. I do a bunch of Blender and JBeam stuff that I kind of understand, but I'm not the best person to explain it. If you want to do this yourself, just watch Filman's video on it, he teaches it better than I ever could. In the end, the wheel is working, and I move on to some very simple node editing. This is very easy, basically you just find a node that's too low, and anything near that height gets a larger Z position in the JBeam. This would take a while if I was trying to line the nodes up with the visible bodywork, but I don't care, and so it only takes a minute or two. Super easy stuff. There's a few other things I do, some of which I mentioned earlier, and some that just don't matter enough to touch on, but in the end, the car works. Let's take it for a drive. I feel like this doesn't really work with a controller. So I bought a wheel. Okay, in reality I'd already had one for a bit. I bought it while filming this video, and while Soup was having his last turn with the car, I put it to use. Even before I named the car, I knew I wanted to run it at Imola. It's my favorite of the very few real-life tracks I know well enough to say I've memorized, and it's one of only three or so with a beam mod I consider good enough to be used as a recurring test track in my videos. By the way, I know Imola is not how this track's name is actually pronounced. I feel, however, that if I try to say it the right way, I will manage to sound both extremely pretentious and make a complete fool of myself at the same time. Imola it is. Anyway, I ran a bunch of benchmarks using mostly beam cars, but also one mod, one custom configuration, and one auto car just for fun. It's the lap I ran with a barstow that you've been seeing while I talked about the track. Some of the benchmark cars were easier than others, but in the end, this is how the leaderboard looked. So let's run the Imola at its namesake circuit and see how it goes. Plenty of wheel spin in first gear, but that goes away when I change up gears. The car's very fast in a straight line. I believe uh, at the end of this straight it gets to like 186, yep. Straight into a chicane. The brakes are excellent, this isn't really a problem. I've got to be very careful on corner exits here, in fact I take basically every corner a gear higher than I need to, because the car is very, very oversteery on power. This corner I could definitely go faster, but I'm not confident in the car or my driving yet, so I don't. The hairpin is the most dangerous corner on the circuit. I've found that the only way that I can get a safe exit on it is to shift up at the end. I can also take the entire corner in third gear, but this particular run I shifted down. There's a little bend here over the crest. The crest always gets this car a bit unstable, but it's fine. I can take this section faster, but I won't. I don't trust the car. Then it goes down through here. I think you can take this section flat, but not in this car. This corner's kind of tight. I take it in third gear. Probably second would be better, but third is stabler. Down this straight, then to a, a chicane. The chicane is generally a difficult braking point for cars, but not this one. The brakes are excellent, it's the one thing on the car that I have absolutely no problems with. The final leg of the circuit is reasonably easy if you don't dip a wheel onto the grass. Some cars need to brake before this bend, but this one doesn't. I actually braked a little bit too early in this run. There's only, like, one corner left, then it's a long straight, and that's what this car loves. I can't think of anything else to say. This racing commentary stuff is really hard. Okay, how fast was it? Wow. 
Okay, that's, um, that's really fast. How fast was it? 16 seconds faster than the SBR4 I tested. It is by far the fastest thing I've run on this circuit. Probably won't be beating this anytime soon, and I'm not entirely sure I want to. That was terrifying. Okay, well, past me does a fairly cautious lap of the Nurburgring. He doesn't have it memorized, and for that matter, present me doesn't either. I'll do some sort of a conclusion. First off, I'd like to genuinely apologize for how long this video took. I've been working on it since late 2022, and although I did that Beamkana video in January, I think I'm on track to release this almost exactly one month after that, which is really not good. I don't plan on taking this long in the future, it's just that this video, which started as Let's Build a Sim Racing Hypercar, and ended with JB and Custom Engine Sounds collaboration, relearning Blender, a new test track, and a $250 wheel, had some serious scope creep. As for the car itself, it's interesting. One of the JBeam mods I didn't mention was decreasing the steering wheel rotation to be more logical with an open top wheel. This means that, both in-game and on my real-life wheel, I only need to turn about 100 degrees or so for full lock. All well and good, but it makes the car very sensitive to little movements when you're driving on a straight, and it also applies to controller too for some reason. Hence the nearly immediate crash when I tested it. This was also not helped by the fact that setting up my wheel and beam somehow removed the dead zone on my controller's left stick, which doesn't even come close to returning to the center. I could have fixed this, but I thought the crash was funny, so I didn't. I don't really want to delay this video any further by making a separate controller config of this car when I upload the mod, so... Probably I'm just going to put instructions on how to do that JBeam yourself in the mod's description. Don't worry, it's incredibly easy. As long as you have a text editor of any kind, you can definitely do this. The JBeam for this car was extensive, and I've actually learned a fair bit making it. I'm never doing a custom engine again unless I have some special reason for it, because it's incredibly time consuming and also the most boring part of this whole build. That's Fulman's thing, anyway. The other stuff, though, particularly the working steering wheel, I definitely will. And I actually plan to get the wheel working on every single car I make with an interior in the future. It's not the easiest thing ever to do, but it's pretty close if you have the extra code on hand or a video tutorial. It really adds to the experience driving in first person, and even for you as a viewer, I think it might do the same, so it's definitely worth the fairly minimal work. All in all, this car is not perfect by any means, but I'd still say it's my best auto beam project to date, and hopefully it's extra runtime. I recorded this whole outro in one take, so I don't know how much time it's added, but I'd guess the video is around half an hour long. Makes it a little more worth the month it took me to make. For now though, it is with great pleasure that I can announce that I'm finally done working on this thing. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.